In a report published by sailor and environmentalist Alan MacArthur, it's forecast that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. But the odd thing about waste plastic pollution is that it's mostly a behavioural problem. You see, we refer to plastic objects as single use, but that really is only because we use them once and then we throw them away. The chemical compounds that are used to make plastics are called polymers. And the one that I'm most interested in is called PET, or polyethylene tetraethylate. It's also known as number one plastic, and it's used to make sushi containers and uh, like fizzy drink bottles. PET makes up 8% of all plastics produced globally and 20% of all plastics used for packaging. And it's these packaging plastics that are referred to as single use. But despite its bad reputation, PET is stronger and lighter than concrete, food safe, transparent, easy to recycle and process, and it's relatively cheap to make. It's also incredibly durable, which is part of the problem. Systems for the processing, recycling of waste plastics are already in place, but long-term end uses for these materials are lacking. Now, this is where things are going to get a little strange. I'm going to make a connection between waste plastic pollution and uh, the construction industry, specifically affordability. While the issue of waste plastic is a problem of having too much, Increasing costs in the construction industry is often driven by having too little. With supply not meeting demand and material prices increasing, it's becoming more expensive to build homes. However, I believe that through the implementation of new construction techniques combined with new and novel materials based on recycled PET, it is possible to increase production in the construction industry while also reducing material usage and cost. My interest in affordable housing comes from seeing people needing homes without the supply to match. And I've also always had a fondness for architecture and a passion for design and technology. I now work in product development and operate additive manufacturing systems, specifically 3D printers. For those of you who don't know, additive manufacturing is the process of creating something layer by layer, where subtractive manufacturing is the process of cutting or milling an object from a solid block of material. For me, as a designer, there are a number of benefits for using additive manufacturing. The biggest one, and probably the largest cost saving, is the automated production, but it also provides greater design freedoms while using the least amount of material possible. Let me show you what I mean. This video shows a vase being printed. As you can see, there is no input from a human. It allows me to press print and then go away and start to design the next object. However, 3D printing isn't without its downsides. It's typically best used for creating highly customized objects produced in short runs. It's not really the best process for creating lots of the same object, but that's precisely why it's so valuable when applied to construction, because architectural design is often unique to each building. It's customized to the needs of the specific client, as well as the environment and the shape and size of the section. Now, one of the most popular types of 3D printing is called FDM or fused disposition modeling, which when plastic is used is basically a hot glue gun on the end of a three-axis robot. This video shows my FDM machine running. The hot end mounts the plastic, which is fed into the machine in the form of a filament, and the three-axis robot moves around in all directions, building up the object layer by layer. Not long after I started in additive manufacturing, I realized that, sure, the objects I created were cool and they were useful, but they were small, and the material I was using, non-recycled PET, was contributing to the waste plastic problem. So I had to look for more sustainable alternatives. 
I found a number of local suppliers of recycled PET in the form of crushed up flakes, but the process of turning that material into filament, which is the format used by most FDM 3D printers, wasn't available in New Zealand. So I teamed up with a company from the Netherlands whose products are made from recycled plastic. And yeah, the irony of importing waste plastic isn't lost on me, but it's what I have to do for now, and I am working on local filament production. But besides these sustainable options, I also looked for options to scale up production and I found a number of manufacturers who produced large-scale 3D printing robots and others who produced systems for processing recycled PET flakes. These two technologies, if combined, would allow me to take large amounts of locally sourced recycled waste plastic and turn it into big new things, pretty much single-handedly and in a single process. So I started to think, well, if I'm going to go big, why not use 3D printing and recycled plastic to produce full-scale architecture? Firstly, I wanted to understand if anybody had used a 3D printer to build a house, and I found a number of existing examples. In 2017, the first people to move into a 3D printed house did so in France, and just last year, the first 3D printed house to meet European building standards was completed in Germany. The only difference was these used concrete and other non-recycled materials. So this, these, these existing examples showed me that it was possible to apply 3D printing technology to full-scale architecture, and it also provided all the benefits of smaller-scale additive manufacturing, such as increased design freedoms, dimensional accuracy, and most importantly, automated production. So what I found was that using 3D printing to produce full-scale architecture, again, was possible. And it did allow for all these new and improved uh, design possibilities. And one of the most important things that we figured out was that there was a lot of cost savings. One of these cost savings comes in the form of being able to print more dynamic and, and a lot of different geometries. For example, with traditional building methods, it often costs three times as much to produce curved structures as it does straight ones. But with 3D printing, Curved walls and straight ones cost exactly the same, and much less than using traditional building methods. I also found a number of examples where recycled PET was used. A company in Canada produced a house made from over 600,000 recycled plastic bottles. However, they used panels to do so. And there are a number of existing products on the market, such as carpets and wall covering products that are made from recycled PET fibers. But again, no one has 3D printed a house using recycled plastic. So at this point, I decided to team up with a friend to research the feasibility of the idea. And we found through our feasibility study, which was based on a review of over 100 research publications on PET, additive manufacturing and recycling processes, that it could be cheaper, significantly faster, emit less carbon while diverting thousands of tons of plastic from the waste stream. Based on the extrusion rate of currently available hardware and the volume of the wall structures for the house that we had designed, we found that a large-scale 3D printer built using available hardware and off-the-shelf parts could produce both the walls and roof of a 150-square-meter house in just two weeks, while diverting more than 20 tons of plastic from the waste stream. So we seemed to figure out that things were possible and this idea didn't seem so crazy, but what about the safety of living in a house made of plastic? A recent study found that PET blocks, when compared with standard masonry blocks made of concrete, were stronger, with the same compression strength and nearly twice the tensile strength. PET also has better insulation properties than concrete. We also found that there were a number of issues around the release of different chemicals from PET. So we looked at what was already known about PET and its effects on human health. We found that based on available evidence, PET was a high quality polymer used in food and beverage packaging. And most governing bodies deem it safe to eat and drink from. 
However, sometimes compounds such as phthalates, which can cause adverse health effects, can leach into the water that is stored in plastic bottles. While the amount of phthalates detected in plastic while water stored in plastic bottles is normally deemed safe for human consumption, it's still something that needs to be considered when moving forward with this project. Another issue of concern are VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. Now, volatile organic compounds are released from most of the materials, coatings, or treatments used to manufacture the things that we buy, including building materials. There are a number of standards that regulate the release of VOCs, and this graphic shows the amount of VOCs released by different polymers under standard weathering conditions, with PET releasing 150 times less VOCs than the likes of LDPE, and 10 times less than PVC, both of which are already used in residential construction. One of the next big issues that's faced is the material science. This is a pretty new field, and what we found was that by using additives that can be derived from other waste streams, such as textile production and recycling, as well as a combination of natural compounds, which can be derived from marble and wood, we could make new sustainable composites with more desirable finish and structural properties. Based on our testing of existing composites and the work of others in the field, we found that we could create new and sustainable composites based on recycled PET that, when mixed with other, again, recycled and natural composites, could look and feel like ceramic with improved insulation, strength, and heat resistance properties. So while the idea of 3D printing houses from recycled plastic may sound a little crazy and far-fetched, I believe that through the combination of existing additive manufacturing processes and systems, combined with new and novel materials made using recycled PET, it might just be possible. And it could change the way that we design and build houses in the future. It seems that we have a couple of problems and a potential solution. We just need to put these pieces together. So the question now is, when will we rise to the challenge of using these materials differently and take responsibility for this plastic mess that we've made so that we can look forward to designing new and cool things in the future? I think that at the very least, it's worth trying.